Welcome to Coffee Can Investing and to our interview with Bharat Shah, Executive Director at ASK Group. Bharat Bhai is one of the few people, in fact, one of the handful of people I know who have been managing money in India for the best part of three decades. Bharat Bhai, welcome to the show. It's a privilege having you here. Um, as I said, uh, you're one of only two or three people that I know who have been managing money in India uh, since the late 80s. And in these 30 years, um, you know, our markets changed radically, the economy has changed radically. Uh, so, would love to hear your thoughts on how, how, how you began the journey at a time when I presume uh, investing in the stock market in the late 80s wasn't a, a favoured profession of, of the bright and the talented. How, how did you enter the stock markets? Well, that's right. I think uh, the profession was regarded, uh, it wasn't even considered a profession. Right. It was regarded as gambler's den. Right. <laughs> uh, and to that extent, uh, it was a tough calling uh, mm. to be taken into. But somehow, right from the college days, uh, I was drawn towards mm. uh, anything to do with the investing. Right. So the, uh, the whole environment uh, was kind of KLO1, uh, where practices were not evolved. Mm. And I myself was just trying to grope and trying to figure out uh, mm. where things were. So I began by uh, kind of uh, take, uh, reading up anything on companies mm -hmm. which will come into the newspapers. Magazines were few and far between. Mm. And I began uh, taking up to the investment books uh, right. at that point of time. So this was more than academic uh, kind of... So the first few books that you read, any recollection, what were the first few books that you that really influenced your thinking on, on investing? Uh, four or five of them, I think. Uh, the Intelligent Investor, certainly. Uh, Conservative Investor, Sleep Well by Phil Fisher. Right. Uh, then the uh, Theory of Value by William Burr. Uh, then the Stocks for the Long Run by Jeremy uh, Siegel. Yeah. So uh, these uh. were some of the very interesting, and of course, security analysis. By Benjamin Graham. So, so, so if, I, if my memory serves me right, your first job wasn't in the stock market. No, it was in the, uh, it started with Asian pain sick. Right, wow. wow. <laughs> so how, 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 what brought you, what was the trigger, what was the catalyst for leaving the world of manufacturing behind and entering the world of investing? No, love for investing was something, as I mentioned, right from my college right. days and then my professional uh, degrees that I pursued of management uh, degree as well as into chartered accountancy and cost accountancy. Mm -hmm. But I kept my own academic interests alive in this area by self-study and right. uh, I would go to uh, Pasti Vendor and buy annual reports in kilos wow. because I couldn't have afforded it to put money and uh, get the stocks to buy, buy the report, stocks yeah. to get the annual reports right. on my own. And uh, that love reflected in every spare moment I could get. I was uh, kind of trying to figure out. So my day job and what I did other than that uh, was very different. At some stage I felt uh, yeah. Uh, what I love the most, uh, what I'm most passionate about is what should be my work as well, mm -hmm. rather than uh, doing something. Uh, I was doing well in what I was doing in the manufacturing area in my finance work, but that's not what I thought was mm -hmm. real, my love and passion. Mm -hmm. So one fine day, I think, uh, uh, when the sentiment became too dominant, I decided to take steps to make a move and in the next three months I did that. Fantastic. So uh, the, 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 the entry into the stock market, was it into an investment role, research role? Uh, it started with the research role uh, really because uh, I myself uh, was learning. Mm -hmm. uh, you always do, mm -hmm. but uh, obviously that is a stage where a lot of my ideas were immature and uh, not adequately fertile and well-backed. Mm. And to that extent, a uh, lot of learning needed to be uh, gone through uh, myself. Mm. But uh, my role as a research head, I joined straight as the head wow. of the research. And to that extent, uh, uh, I, I thought it gave me pretty, pretty good initial grounding right. to get into that area. Right. Uh, to get into the investments field. Actually. So for people like me, Bharat Bhai, who have only been in the Indian market for a decade or so, the picture we have is, you know, of a Indian market in the early 90s, through the 90s of 
you know, modest amounts of research or almost no research on lots of stocks and therefore an inefficient market. And then gradually as we come to the current day, increasing amount of brokerages writing on stocks and therefore market efficiency improving. Um, now, uh, if, in, if that indeed is the case, one would presume that a fundamentally oriented investor like you, your investment style must have evolved over time. Could you talk us uh, through that journey a little bit? I think... Uh four or five areas where I would say uh, the journey has evolved. Mm. Uh, one, typically my buy uh, quality and efficiency mm. relatively was better. Right. It was my sale efficiency which was somewhat inferior compared to my buy efficiency. This is in the early days of your career. Uh, uh, early and I would say to some extent that weakness uh, persists throughout. Okay. Uh, but uh, relatively, uh, I would say the mistakes committed in picking the right things was fewer. were uh, much fewer. Mm -hmm. uh, the mistakes made in selling at an appropriate time uh, or disengaging uh, at a right point of time, I think uh, that is something that uh, has been required to be evolved significantly at mine. Secondly, I think the value of intangibles you realize in your investment journey over a period of time. Mm. Uh, so you begin, you start putting too much premium on the tangibles mm. and, or the numbers and the data, mm. but you realize that uh, more than the tangibles, it is the intangibles mm. which make for a great uh, long-term investing. And uh, therefore, Qualitative filters, to my mind, are the first ones to filter out the universe rather than the quantitative I ones. See. Because qualitative ones allow you to filter away a much larger amount of the universe in one go. Maybe 90% and more can be simply eliminated on management quality filter. So you don't really have to waste time on mm. looking at the numbers of a very vast uh, majority of universe. Third, I would say, my valuation capability evolved over a period of time. That is one area where certainly I would say uh, the ability to judge the valuation, mm. understand it well, mm. uh, define it in a more crunchable way, mm. and to kind of test that valuation understanding from what-if kind of scenarios. Mm. That is something uh, definitely I think has evolved uh, materially over a period of time. Fourth, uh, I think more than the intellect, uh, the role of wisdom mm. uh, you realize is much higher. I see. Uh, more than just the gray cells, it is discipline mm. and the temperament uh, which is far more critical. And I think you, as you, uh, as you go ahead, make mistakes, mm. stumble, fumble, and uh, probably you get on the right path. So I think with innumerable number of errors and mistakes made, finally, mm. the value of the discipline, value of the uh, uh, the wisdom over just the cutting, uh, mm. kind of serrating intellect, and the value of, uh, so to say, temperament, mm -hmm. not to get uh, flummoxed or carried away by the uh, market fed and fashions. Sure. Sure. Uh, and without being arrogant, uh, yet at the same time remaining uh, kind of flexible. Mm. I think it's a very difficult combination to be uh, working at. Um, uh, there's only a thin line between arrogance and conviction. And I think uh, over a period of time, you learn to uh, kind of get a right balance of the two. Right. So there's a lot of wisdom packed into those uh, four bullet points. Let me just try to see if we can uh, delve into each of those a little bit. So just to start with the cell discipline, sir. Um, you, you said that your cell discipline, your cell efficiency improved over time. Can you sort of, you know, spot what are the couple of things or two or three things that helped you improve your cell discipline over uh, time? Most important one has been uh, a very strong valuation model. I see. So once you have a good valuation mm. model, you can query the price from a variety of point of view. Uh, uh, one way to look at it is if the price is right, yeah. what does it imply? And whether that tallies with your mental picture of what that business looks like. Mm. 
I mean, one way to look at it will be that if uh, price is right, what is the implied growth at what kind of capital efficiency mm. for what length of time for right. this valuation to make sense to you? Right. Right. And to that extent, you have a more objective and more uh, efficient way to look at that rather than more emotional, uh, uh, something which has worked for you for a very long period of time. Mm. It usually, you tend to develop a favorable bias. Yes, and that's right. The blind spots are many. Uh, and you tend to disregard them. Or even if you recognize intellectually, mm. uh, I think uh, the other side of the brain mm. uh, or heart uh, kind of prevents you from recognizing. Right. Right. So I think uh, when you have a good uh, valuation smart. model, which you work at it properly, and most importantly, that you listen to it, right. then I think uh, you start developing a much better uh, way of doing. Uh, this is not to say that still uh, some of the old weaknesses don't come to haunt me. Right. They still time to time do. But by and large, I think it is much more solid right. uh, than before. So, so, you know, if a bright young analyst sort of comes to, comes to you and says, look, sir, here's my, here's my world-class valuation model. To your mind, what are the sort of two or three things you look for to say, that, this, that these are the, at least the three minimum characteristics that a good valuation model should have? First and foremost, it must include uh, the character of business as a part of uh, the valuation model. Okay. I think the English that we do mm. uh, must finally subsume into the mathematics. Okay. So the English will tell you about how good the business is and mm. what is the character, what makes it invincible mm. or what makes it fail, what can be uh, uh, weak spots and the strong points. Mm. All that understanding, that mm. English, eventually must translate into uh, kind of tangible numbers mm. in form of uh, the understanding of the size of opportunity feeding into the rate of growth, mm. its sustainability with uh, the kind of quality and uh, character with which that growth will occur, mm. whether the growth will be predated or mm. antedated, uh, mm. growth will be even or volatile, mm. uh, it will be growing faster in the initial phase or later, etc., etc. All these uh, ultimately, mathematical part uh, that you need to answer by having gone through the English of investing or the grammar of investing. So I think the it begins with the art of investing and it must uh, uh, kind of uh, subsume itself into the, hmm. finally, the science or the mathematics of the, that. Second, uh, however hard it is to mm -hmm. gaze into the future mm -hmm. and uh, given the fact that the shelf life of businesses and ideas mm -hmm. is getting crunched and crunched more and more mm -hmm. given mm -hmm. the way the world has become very fast-paced changing mm -hmm. kind of a world but still uh, there is no alternative but to gaze into the future. Mm -hmm. Investing is substantially into the future, mm -hmm. past and the present are at best a minor guide and not really a very material part of the totality. Sure. So the gazing into the future uh, uh, is, and, uh, and um, there are no tangible answers when mm. you do that. So your own conviction, your experience, your insights, the quality of the good work that you've done, mm. all that will give you confidence whether your model is right. And even if uh, markets are making it look like other way around, mm. not to surrender your confidence so long as you believe what you're doing is right. Sure. So I think uh, ability to gaze into the future mm. uh, well and with confidence with Elan is a must. Third, I, <clears throat> I would say some of the traditional measures of valuation are so pathetic. I mm. mean, price earning multiple is so popular, yeah. but it is such a misleading way to value a business, but it remains eminently popular, mm. and uh, uh, it is actually misleading. Mm. Uh, because that uh, measurement, which is simple to understand and easy to compare, mm. uh, doesn't make it a good and efficient one, and therefore, bad habits of using faulty models of this kind, mm. uh, serious indeed. investment people have to give up. Right. And uh, really, even if it is harder, but there is no option but to kind of look into the right one. 
Bharat bhai, the, the, the area of valuation where people like me struggle with the most is, is lending stocks, uh, banks and BFCs. For one, there is no concept of free cash flow for lenders. Secondly, these are immensely cyclical businesses, cyclical both in terms of top line and in terms of uh, bottom line because NPAs tend to fluctuate through the business cycle. Uh, and yet, lenders form 35-40% of the market cap of the stock market, so one can't really build a portfolio without having some representation from this constituency. How have you tackled the valuation challenge with respect to lenders? I think the traditional way to value mm. Uh, which is price to book is a false one. Right. And unfortunately, that is the one which is used Default. more often yeah. by everybody. Absolutely. And to that extent, the results are completely mm. uh, disparate ones. Right. Uh, you've got um, finance businesses at half uh, price to book, one, two, mm. five, yeah. seven and a half, and 15. Yes, uh, yes. You've got whole range. Yeah. So that can't really be the answer. I think, once again, uh, the sustainability part in the valuation, which price to book or a price to earning multiple can never capture, mm. needs to be brought in. So really speaking, the way to look at the finance business is to convert mm. uh, the price really paid on that book mm. into a kind of a yield for you at mm. a point zero when you start. Okay. Let's say, I mean, if a business is making a 20% mm. uh, uh, say return on equity mm. and the price to uh, book is say two times, yeah. effectively what you are starting on that business is with a 10% yield. Okay. Now that gives you a starting point to understand how do you uh, carry your valuation model. Then you bring in the element of capital efficiency, mm. you bring in the element of the likely growth rate based mm. on your judgment of size of opportunity, mm. uh, based on their lending capability and the practices and their approach, mm. uh, what kind of uh, credit losses you think uh, so uh, that could arise, mm. and uh, the period of time for which you think uh, uh, the uh, kind of a growth rate you believe could exist mm. given the size of opportunity and the capability of management. Mm. The final part you need to bring into account is the payout ratios. Mm. Uh, though the finance businesses typically, the payout uh, are uh, meaninglessly, meaningfully small actually, mm. and given the fact that raw material is money, so mm. they don't give out too much. Mm. But uh, you do still have firms. Mm. where the payout ratios are meaningfully higher than what you traditionally see. Right. And therefore, yeah. that element also has to be incorporated into the account. Mm. Mm. Once you do that, uh, then you have a, a much better way uh, uh, to kind of uh, uh, create a right kind of a model. Right. To, uh, to start with that example of 10% yield in a 20% mm. ROE where yeah. there is a two-time price to book, yes. once, you build, uh, once you bring in, let's say, a growth rate, mm. Uh, then what is a 10% uh, yield to begin with, mm. uh, let's say with a 20% growth, yeah. may become 12% in the year one, and then uh, let's say 144 mm. and likewise. Mm. And you can plot a series of annuities to kind of work your way through that. Wow. Uh, alternate also in a conceptual way, the way to look at it is, mm. because there is no concept of return on capital employed in a finance right. business, yes. uh, but there is a return on equity, which yeah. subsumes within itself everything that is there to be uh, checked, mm. really. And uh, that return on equity conceptually can be converted into return on capital employed the way you do it in a manufacturing mm. business. Mm. There is a conceptual path to evolve with like mm. that. Mm. Once you have a return on capital employed established, mm. and uh, you can uh, then really follow a similar valuation model like you would do for a manufacturing firm mm. to kind of evolve your uh, valuation for the finance businesses. Exactly. Yeah. So those uh, two paths uh, really give you a uh, good answer mm. in terms of figuring out uh, uh, in a more tangible way the valuation of the finance businesses. Some of the finance businesses, if you observe, mm. even though despite their remarkable, uh, consistent, uh, strong growth rate over a period of time, mm. 
uh, they have not diluted a capital even for decades. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. therefore, in some sense, uh, they become like a consumer firms. Yeah, yeah. And uh, because since they don't dilute the capital, really speaking, uh, in a similar way to price earning multiple that you would do for an FMCG company, mm -hmm. uh, but not price earning multiple, the valuation model mm -hmm. properly mm -hmm. is a DCF. Mm -hmm. Similar approach you can add up for uh, those right. firms. Yeah. Uh, to create a kind of a valuation model. And uh, therefore, a firm like Gru Finance, uh, yeah. for example, which is always look very expensive, yes. which is uh, actually remain probably among the most expensive ones a for time. a yeah. very, very long time yes. yeah. uh, compared to its much larger brethren and yeah. sisters yeah. all around. Right. And yet, uh, consistently, uh, I found that Gru has remained actually reasonably priced once you bring in all the right elements into the valuation model. Effectively bringing in capital efficiency or ROE Absolutely. and you're bringing in growth and if yes. you can integrate the and the sustainability right so sustainable ROE sustainable growth in a way warrants an expensive valuation the question is how do you put that in a framework and, and, and I think what you've given us is more clues than I have received I have to concede in the whole of my career and how to value financials let me just sort of try to contextualize your career a little bit so so obviously the one investor on whom tons of uh, 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 books have been written is Warren Buffett. And if you look at Buffett's career, when he began, he was a true Ben Graham disciple, you know, deep value investing, cigar butt investing and so on. And then as he moved through the 60s and 70s, the American stock market evolved, became more richly valued. He became more of a uh, growth investor, although I'm sure he'll never quite clearly admit it. He became more of a Phil Fisher style of investor. So stocks like Coke, Microsoft, uh, more recently Apple uh, entered his portfolio in large measure. Um, your career obviously is not as long as Buffett's, but you've lived in India through a very similar period where we have moved from being a very poor country in the 80s with an underdeveloped stock market to now a $3 trillion stock market with the large cap space uh, almost having 100 large cap mutual funds. Would you say your career, your investment philosophy has also evolved say, away, you know, from value investing towards more a growth investing style and so on? Yes, uh, without any doubt, I would say that. Uh, the journey, if I, as I alluded earlier mm. uh, to, uh, the journey from tangible to intangibles mm. is really the journey of investing. Right. Uh, tangibles right. are easy to recognize, mm. easy to feel and touch. But it is intangibles uh, or which you kind of ruminate over for a long period of time till they become a part of your culture, part of your investment character. Uh, those intangibles don't merely uh, confine to uh, the ideas like management quality and the capital efficiency and the sustainability and the such rather than pure cigar but kind of a cheapness mm. uh, which Graham came to advocate. Uh, clearly, Graham, uh, Graham's investing came about at the time uh, when uh, cheapness was the most dominant idea. Mm. His investing came about at the time of the Great Depression. Mm. And therefore, everything uh, in a market which mm. fell almost 90% from the peak in that four-year horrendous journey mm. of the Great Depression, everything had uh, become cheap. Mm. Uh, and therefore, uh, that cigar butt kind of investing got shaped because of the milieu in which uh, Graham conceived his investing. Right, yes. And uh, clearly, the idea of sustainability mm. uh, and the idea of cigar butter are kind of, uh, in some sense, uh, poles apart. Mm. And that sustainability mm. brings in yeah. uh, the capability to look into the future, bring it to the present, and how confident you are mm. about that sustainable future. Mm. So mm, it is those ideas plus I think the intangibles in terms of recognizing mm. our own fallibility, markets fallibility also at a point of time, mm. uh, the role of wisdom and discipline and temperament rather than uh, arrogance uh, which comes from the intellect. Mm. Uh, all these are critical insights and learnings that you develop over a period of time. Mm. Or at least I would say in a period where I really didn't have uh, people to turn to, to uh, develop, uh, get learning from, mm. you had to learn it by reading and by making mistakes. Mm. 
So I have had a fair share of both. Mm. Uh, so there was a good recorded history of the Wall Street to read. Right. Right. And of course, uh, an abundant amount of my own mistakes to rely upon and draw inferences. Right. right. So, so whilst m you know, m most people out there have heard about Buffett and um, many people have read plenty about Buffett, uh, Phil Fisher as an investor is less known in India. Uh, clearly, he's had an influence on your thinking about quality and, and how to assess quality. Could you sort of take us through a little bit as to, you know, how basis, you know, Phil Fisher's sort of inspiration, how you've tried to, uh, you know, put more, you know, get a hand around this whole concept, nebulous concept of quality? Well, first and foremost, uh, quality is vital because that's an antidote to uh, permanent loss of capital. Right. Uh, you know, the least that you'll achieve uh, by focusing on quality is that probably you'll not lose your money. Mm. And this is something that doesn't come easily to mm. people. Mm. Uh, like uh, 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 Talib was mentioning, that probably the craft of investing you learn in five to ten years, mm. by and large, mm. uh, the techniques and the mechanics yeah. of it. But probably you take 25 years to learn mm. uh, that how not to lose mm. money that you actually made. And uh, unfortunately, a lot of time is probably because as a country, we are uh, emerging from the shadows of the mm. poverty and the kind of destitution that we have had mm. for a long period of time uh, to a bigger and more successful country. Mm. So uh, there is a rush and there is a hurry to get appreciation as a prime uh, factor. Mm. But I think preservation comes first. Uh, uh, appreciation, of course, is important, but uh, almost important. But I would say preservation is probably 50.1 oh. and uh, appreciation is 49.9. It is that little extra which is uh, critical. Second, uh, quality is not as nebulous as it appears. Okay. Management quality is not as nebulous an idea as uh, it appears, primarily mm. speaking. Mm. Uh, good management as well as the bad ones, they leave their telltale signs mm. uh, over a period of time. Only we need to have patience and desire to study. More importantly, not forget those lessons mm. that uh, flirting with the bad management mm. is uh, fundamentally a poor thing and uh, can actually be value destructive. Mm. Uh, time to time we tend to forget this lesson and mm. therefore we flirt. Mm. And therefore we think uh, that we have evolved enough to be able to get away with it, mm. but you can't get away from that. Bad managements have a way of ensnaring you, mm. uh, getting them into your fold and right. eventually destroying you. It's a poisonous embrace. Mm. And it's very, very difficult to get out of the that poisonous lock that you get into when, mm. when, when you sleep with a bad management. So when you study the management, what they've done, what they've said, what they have actually uh, left their imprint in terms of uh, 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 the kind of deeds that mm. they have made. The track record. Uh, the track record is, uh, it invariably gives away everything that is there to be given away. Wow. We need to just have patience and uh, desire to go through that uh, carefully and apply it as a practical uh, principle to be adapted. As I said, just by putting management quality, more than 90% of the universe mm. drops away. Mm. Uh, you don't have to waste your time and energy in trying to figure out those businesses. You don't have to waste your time and energy into trying to unravel their balance sheet and uh, all of that is there. You save yourselves a lot of time mm. because investing is more about exclusion rather than inclusion. Mm. Inclusion is a politically very expedient idea. Mm. But the world of investing is not about democracy. It is about exclusion first. Yeah and then only picking and choosing out of what is left behind. Mm. Third, I think uh, quality of business, for example, mm. again is not as nebulous. Uh, return on capital employed and sustained one over a period of time is a great indicator mm. uh, of uh, how and in what way the quality of business is really shaped and is likely to be there. Mm. A good, well-judged return on capital employed is in fact it rises above the constraints of any sector or any uh, other milieu. It allows a comparison across different kinds of businesses in a very efficient way. Right. 
And similarly, I think uh, return on equity, in mm. some sense, like Phil Fisher has said, mm. is a holy grail of a good in good man management. So there are uh, the quality part, the quality of management, the quality of the business, the quality of the financial position, mm. Mm. which often emanate uh, uh, emanates from the first two, but not necessarily so. Uh, even a quality, honest management, when it misallocates capital, mm. there is an impact on the uh, financial position. Right. And it lingers on for a very long period of time than what they would like to shrug it away with. Right. So it sounds intangible, but I think uh, there are enough uh, concrete, tangible ways to judge it. Management quality also, if uh, really we have to crunch it into some more uh, uh, tangible idea, mm. um, integrity, uh, execution, mm. governance, mm. Uh, vision, capital allocation, capital distribution, these are several buckets which if you analyze each bucket, uh, then you really get an idea that right. it's not right. about only integrity but also competence. It's not only about reason but a good execution. Mm. And it is not only about sound capital allocation to good businesses within the fold of the business, but also sound capital distribution. All of these, once you Template, uh, once you put a template around each one of them, then there is a way of making a crunchable right. uh, data around it. Right. So you're saying there are many different pillars on which a good management team sort of rests and you can, and you can sort of get your, uh, you can put, put substance around those pillars and, and go yeah. forth and investigate. So Bharadwai, I think as an industry, uh, financial services, asset management industry, you've come a full circle from the late 80s when the industry was small, career opportunities were few, to now say $150 billion of equity assets under management. And, uh, and we've reached a juncture where many thousands of bright, young, talented uh, uh, boys and girls want to enter uh, the industry and, and they want to emulate people like you. What, what advice would you give to an aspiring uh, uh, fund manager in our country? Uh, no advice, but I would uh, really say that uh, the young people are lucky if uh, they are into the entering into or have entered into the world of investing in India of today. Mm. Uh, we, uh, is an economy we have evolved, is markets we have evolved. Mm. Now there is some level of history about Indian markets. Uh, there is reasonable literature about investment practices that have evolved in the mm. country. And of course, uh, there is a long uh, Three century of the global history of investing before uh, the uh, before the potential investment experience in this country, but I think uh, in a country which is getting to be prosperous and getting to be successful mm. like India is today, and um, where the practices and craft has been reasonably well embellished, sure. I think it is much much uh, easier to step into those kind of situations and really. Be your cater because right. you have antecedents and you can look forward to the, the foundations uh, have really been laid foundation is available uh, secondly there is advice also available to look forward to yeah. uh, which is something I sorely missed in my time so all the mistakes were yours and it's a very lonely work investing uh, is a work where success rarely gets uh, acknowledged, but the failures are always reminded yeah. on a day-to-day -day basis. Yes. And all of that you have to leave by yourself. I mean, you really have nobody to turn to. Mm. So it, in some sense, it's a very lonely, demanding kind of a work. Somebody whom you can trust into, somebody whom you believe into, mm. somebody who can give a genuine uh, shoulder to kind of lead on to, to learn and take an advice, uh, really that is something I sorely missed in my uh, investing career right. uh, by and large. Uh, I think today young people can look forward to at least that support at a critical juncture of their career yeah, and of their lives. They don't need it on a day-to-day -day basis, but there can be moments where you do everything right, but you can be made to look like a fool. And also equally, when you do right or foolish things and markets may make you look like a genius for a short period of time. But in those tentative moments where your own confidence is at a low, where you start questioning your own personal or your capability or the externality around you, uh, 
some handholding and some right advice at that stage it takes you, uh, it helps you in overcoming those very important uh, moments of the right. life. Right. Otherwise, that can make a difference between kind of sinking or sailing through. And uh, I, I would say uh, the uh, most important one for them is that they have an opportunity to practice this over a very long period of time. Sure. Um, for, for somebody like me, uh, I had to begin in late 20s into, uh, into the investing. Uh, uh, though I began in my, uh, so to say, adulthood into the investing on my own. But in late 20s, uh, I got into the professional work and then uh, soon thereafter, I got into the professional investing. Uh, therefore, I uh, had, and then you spend some years in repairing your mistakes and right. uh, refining your craft and uh, getting your understanding to be in place while discharging responsibility in a proper way. So considerable time goes so away before you really right. begin the crescent. Whereas for, for youngsters, these days, the, the years of learning can be crunched. Can be compressed and they can get into a high note uh, relatively uh, a, early enough and therefore to look forward to that sheer power of compounding for a much, much longer period of time. Oh, thank you very much, Bharat. Why thank you for those words of wisdom. Yes. So, so that's it from us. That's it from, from, from Bharat Shah, Executive Director at ASK, one of the handful of people I know in India who worked in the stock market for the best part of 30 years. Thank you.